four four just seven stand by a minute just come on uh uh, what is your attack on? Okay, talk to him, see what that did. Charlie Hart, 98, 24, traffic 27. Uh, 85 just made a pass in there. Uh, 21, 77. Roger, sir, be advised, we have John Green, 21 okay, and 66 standing by over our Okay, I'll put it a little closer than those trees. Let me come around with a Lau 3 and I'll put it on those trees there. Uh, Roger that, Lau 3. Uh, name is uh, George Merritt. I was actually a test pilot in the Air Force as a captain at Edwards Air Force Base when I got the assignment to go to Southeast Asia in the 602nd Fighter Squadron a Commando uh, in, uh, that was at the time stationed in Udorn. This was uh, April of 1968. So um, off I went for what was to be a war of uh, one year uh, before that. Uh, if you got a hundred missions in North Vietnam, you could come back. But by then, at that particular time, there was a bombing halt, so nobody was going in uh, very far into North Vietnam. So it was more likely to be one year than a hundred missions. And what aircraft did you fly while you were there? Well, it was an A-1 Sky Raider, which was really a downer for me because at Edwards, I was flying all the latest Air Force fighters. And so I was going out at Mach 2 in an orange flying suit and a special helmet, a special glove, special boots, you know, kind of the uh, space cadet of, of the Air Force. And now I was going to go to war in a tailwheel prop airplane that flew at 160 indicated speed. So I was not a happy person to go. I was a non-volunteer. I uh, married, had a child, two sons. One was probably six and the other was three. Uh, so it didn't make sense to volunteer to go to war, I didn't think, because I had a very good job in the Air Force. But, you know, you get the orders and you salute and off you go to war. What was your first memory of Vietnam when you arrived? It was interesting because we came in on a C-130 and it was raining. And I remember that it looked like a lot of the buildings had like redwood and a lot of soil had a red part to it. And I thought red, blood is red too. That, that was the significance that I saw that it, this, was, this was bloody country. Even, even the, the, uh, the red was something different. This was, there was, this was a blood mission. And you were at Udorn. Did you go to Nakam Phnom? Did, were you part of that? When they, was it Udorn that closed that went to, or was that? Um... Yeah, so uh, what happened, I got there in April. And uh, you go through quite an endeavor when you first uh, get there. You got to make your maps and charts. You got to learn the rules of engagement. You got to learn all the codes. Uh, so it's, it's quite a build up to, to get to fly. And we were at Udorn which was a, a, a concrete runway. There was three F-4 squadrons there for, uh, I guess, a, a quarter. You could take a taxi downtown, pretty good-sized town. You get steak dinner, get some beer, get clothing made, all kinds of gifts that you could send home. It was, it was, it was a nice, nice base. We had a nice facility. They had a good, good officer's club. So the plan was is that you would fly five flights with an instructor pilot in the right seat. And you would be a wingman, so you would go out for a strike mission, not a rescue mission, a strike mission, to start uh, working your way into feeling comfortable to being a, a, a good gunner in, in combat. So that was kind of the sequence that you, uh, that you went through. So we were at Udorn, the squadron moved over to NKP in about July. So I spent two, three months uh, at, at Udorn. I hear it was a uh, a stark difference between the two bases. It was absolutely a, a stark difference. Uh, Nakhon Phnom was over by the Mekong River. Uh, the reason really we moved over is that's where the Jolly Green Squadron was and, and our sandy missions required us working with the Jolly Greens. So we were closer to them. <clears throat> we were also closer to the battlefield by 40, 50, 60 miles, something like that, so we could get to Megia Pass and the places that we were going for rescues uh, faster. Uh, but now it had a pure steel planking, um, 
It uh, off base, I think only 10% of the people could be off base at one time. It was a 10 o'clock curfew. It was a bus that went in there on a dusty road. You got downtown and there really wasn't much much to see or do or do maybe have something to eat but it wasn't it wasn't like Udorn and one of the guys went downtown one time and was looking out at the uh, Mekong River and saw a body floating down and so when he passed that out you know everybody kind of said well I'm not sure it's even worth going uh, so I think I went twice so you know to some degree it's kind of like being in a prison. And actually, it looked like a prison from the air. Uh, I took a couple of shots, one of, of uh, Beggarly. He was my wingman one time, and I had a Pentax camera. Uh, and you could open up the canopy in flight, and I had just taken off to the south and was making a 180 t turn to go north. And he was joining up with me, and I took a photograph of, I think it's in my book, of, of him with full load of, of armament, color sl slide, and the whole Nakan Phanam there. And it, it looks just like a California prison uh, with, the, with the fences all the way around it and all the ground cleared. There wasn't, wasn't jungle on the inside. This was to keep people from infiltrating. But in reality, we were kind of in a prison. We were, that's where we were. Um, one year. One year. So can you tell me about your first mission what, what was one of those rides was there anything eventful that happened that pops in your mind on your first check rides you know it is because it's hot it's humid you're um you're trying to do good and uh n knowing where you're flying uh was very difficult to tell it's it's rolling hills karst and and a jungle environment and uh, you wonder whether you're going to be able to spot the target. And if you do spot the target, can you put your weapons anywhere close to it? And uh, so you're, uh, you're, you want to pull your weight. You don't want to be somebody that's holding everything up. Uh, you're, you don't want to be the reason that things don't work. And so I guess what, what uh, I remember is we made multiple passes. And then when it was time to go home, I didn't know which direction to go. <laughs> <laughs> you've you've right. been going in circles and concentrating on that, and suddenly it's over, and now which way is home? Uh, I, I just didn't know. And so it's kind of, again, an unnerv unnerving feeling to not know where you're going. I don't think people understand the terrain and the vastness of the triple canopy jungle and the cars. It's until you got to really know the area and know the geographic boundaries. Right. Mm -hmm. It had to be absolutely right. bewildering. You, you learn it. Uh, we flew a lot. I flew 188 combat missions in my time period. So uh, I knew I knew the terrain at that time very, very well. Matter of fact, even one time when I came home on television, on CBS, I saw a segment of combat in, in uh, Laos and I recognized the road that I saw on, on TV. So I still remembered, oh, I know, I know exactly where that was. Uh, so it's a learning experience. You get better and better, kind of like sport, uh, you know, on being on a team. Pretty soon you are all starting to work, work together. It takes a while. Can you tell me about your first SAR mission? And uh, um, can you define SAR and CSAR for folks so they understand? I see on your shirt we've got CSAR. So I know what that is, but can right. you go ahead and... Well, SAR is search, search and, and rescue, and this actually has to do with my first rescue, and I'll try and and make it uh, short. So the way that it worked was that you become a strike wingman. And then after the five flights, you, you're solo. You, now you're the only one in the airplane and you fly with your, with your lead. Then uh, after so many missions, you could, you could move up to now becoming a rescue wingman. And eventually a strike lead, and then the most complicated thing would be to be a rescue lead. You're you're running running the rescue. Well, um, I was had flown enough flights that I became a a, a SAR, a Sandy, a wingman, and a Navy A7 got shot down in a place called Chapone, 
which was a very dangerous place. I'd never been anywhere as close to that. And I was a Sandy Four. So um, one and two led the way, and Ed Leonard, who was Sandy Seven, I was Sandy Eight, we escorted the helicopters to a safe area into an, into an orbit. And within just a few minutes, Sandy One got shot and headed home, got hit in the engine, and his wingman went with him. And I remember seeing him fly back to Nikon Phnom. He was just a speck in the sky. Sun had already set, and he, you could see smoke coming out uh, with the golden glow of sunset. And on the ground, you could see the burning wreckage of, of the A-7. So now, my lead, Ed Leonard, is now in charge just the two of, two of us, we leave the helicopters and go in. I'm flying above him, and this has become kind of a hot, a hot area because now one airplane's been shot down, one's been shot up. So the idea was to bring in, the, in some jets. Uh, so my duty was to talk with the uh, uh, airborne command and control, find out which flights are coming in, what kind of ordnance. So I'm writing that down, banking back and forth, and suddenly I see an explosion on the ground and another parachute go into the trees. And so I called Sandy Seven with no answer. And then I realized my lead has been shot down. I am the only one left. There's now two guys on the ground. It's just me and two helicopters. I had never performed a rescue. I was the deer in the headlight. This was probably the worst experience I had ever had. What what do we got? This whole thing has fallen apart completely. I'm the only one left. And it's nighttime on the ground. We didn't make rescues in the nighttime. I didn't even know how to make one in the daytime. Anyhow, long story short, um, Ed survived <clears throat> the parachute, called out that he was resting before he crossed a road heading to the northwest. They, call, they called it off. We only got one, one Sandy left. Uh, let's go home and, and regroup for... Uh, day two. So um, I was involved with day two. Now I moved up to position two and uh, still four, air, four air airplanes and we headed out. Well, the first day was totally clear, just not a cloud in the sky. The second day was crappy day, all kinds of rain and everything. When we got on scene, the jets had already been just bombing and bombing and bombing. We could see streak could go across there. Man, they were just bombing the BGs. As a matter of fact, I even thought they were bombing northwest of where Ed had gone down. So he's on the ground. Nobody knows where he is. He didn't come up on the radio. The Navy pilot did. And matter of fact, we heard, we heard him. And then some scud, low scud moved in and the jets couldn't bomb through that. And uh, Kenny Fields was the Navy pilot. He said, they're getting really close to me. Get some ordnance down here. So uh, my lead and I went down and um, tried to uh, put some ordnance down. And now my lead, he gets hit. And he pulls, pulls, <laughs> pulls off to get out of the area. I joined up with him underneath his, air, in his airplane. I see fluid coming out of the bottom of the airplane. I don't know whether it's gas, oil, or what the hell it is. So, you know, you, you got hit, you're, you're dropping stuff. And so I pulled aside and he jettisoned all, the, uh, all of his ordnance. And we're only a couple thousand feet above, above the ground. And he said, oil is starting to come back in the cockpit. This thing carried 37 and a half gallons of, of oil big radial engine in the front. Well, that's where all the oil is too, right around the engine. And he said, it's, the oil's getting hot. I'm having a hard time hanging on to the stick because oil's coming in the cockpit. And finally said, I'm getting out. And so uh, he ejected. I was from 15 feet off of, off of his left wing, saw the canopy all the go, and it looked like he stood up and out he went and he got a good good shoot and was swinging along and his airplane is still just flying straight but it's going going down downhill and i knew he was good and i could find him and i thought you know other people have said i saw this airplane crash go right into the mountain i'd never seen an airplane go in the mountain so i followed it 
And down it went, and it goes kersplash, swing back around, and he's coming down, lands on top of a dead, a dead tree. And I called the jollies, and we gave an ADF fix. You could come up on, on the radio and had a little instrument that would, would point. And so, because uh, I didn't know where we were, we were just someplace west where he had punched out. I don't know whether it's danger down there, it's trees, but there could be all kinds of things under the trees. You couldn't see the trails many places. And so the Jolly Green uh, came in. Uh, they went into a hover above him, but the downdraft knocked him, the branches, the dead branches, knocked him down, knocked him unconscious. So then the pararescue guy had to uh, go down on the penetrator and pick him up, and up he came, and we headed home. So uh, now you've had th four aircraft that have either been yeah, the, shot down or damaged. I think it, uh, yeah. Pilots on the ground. Uh, you're right. It ended up uh, being some 189 sorties were flown to get the Navy pilot out. We ended up losing seven planes between the Navy, uh, the Navy and the and the Air Force. Uh, so then, um, so I went home again by myself. I came out as a as a wingman and went home uh, leading the Jolly Greens. So on day third. Uh, three, I uh, was set up to go again, and I, that's when I said to him, you know, um, I'm not doing too good here. I've lost my, my, two, my two leads. Maybe you ought to bring in more experienced people. And they said, no, you've been there for two days. You're as good as anyone, so off you, off you go. So day three, we go out again, and I moved to position four again. And um, uh, we make contact with the Navy, the Navy pilot. He's not in very good, very good shape. His one battery has completely down, and now he's on his second and last battery, and it's starting to get a little bit, a uh, little bit weak. Uh, the older guys thought it was a trap that they could have picked up the Navy pilot anytime they wanted to, but but they know we're coming, and they've had some pretty good shooting. They've They've uh, taken us to the cleaners with, uh, with ground fire. So um, uh, there was reluctance on how in the hell to do this. So there was a, a FAC, a forward air controller, uh, working the jets, and an F-4 went in and dropped uh, CBU, cluster bomb units. And somewhat by mistake, he bombed the survivor. So now uh, the Navy pilot is injured down there, and he's he's bleeding. And he's not very happy with the Air Force. This is his third day. He's had his hopes go up as when he hears people come in, and then they leave. And uh, now he's injured, and his radio is just about dead. So he was kind of pissed, and he said, "If you guys are ever going to get me, get me now. I'm bleeding." And so uh, Tom, I forget his name, was now the the lead and uh, went in to uh, pick him up, and Tom did a masterful job picking him up. He ended up getting the Air Force uh, cross. Dave Richardson was flying the helicopter. He, uh, he went in to pick up uh, Kenny, went into a hover, and said he was surrounded by a white light as he was in the hover. He took that to be that he was being protected by God. He was only uh, like a week away from finishing up his year tour and going and going home. He'd been on several rescues. He was obviously experienced. Uh, they picked up uh, Kenny Fields and um, took him uh, to Nakhon Phnom Hospital. Uh, we were still flying out of Udorn, so always went. We went back to Udorn. I was kind of sad about that because I would have liked to have met him. Uh, but um, our squadron commander then went on alert as a, a Sandy, because we were through. Now, this was three days that we had been flying. We went back to Dorn uh, to recycle. And the squadron commander went over and met Kenny Fields in the, in the hospital. And uh, interesting story that Kenny said that his wife was pregnant at the time. He had two children, but she was pregnant. 
and to honor the Sandys that had rescued him, he was going to name his child Sandy, uh, whether it was a boy or girl. It's a, it is a name that can be used in, in, in e either way. He didn't, but that's what he said. It, it's a long story because I still keep in touch with him now 50 years later. We've done many, many things. It's, that is fantastic. It's, it's a long story. That's one of the questions I always ask. Did you ever get a chance to meet? Oh, abs absolutely. I mean, um, so really, it's in, the interesting part in one respect is then when I uh, got back to Udorn, the big question was Ed Leonard. We hadn't heard from him for three days. What in the hell happened to him? We weren't concerned about Kenny. We'd rescued him. He was somebody else's problem. And uh, so uh, Ed was a very experienced aviator. He had flown for a full year and then decided to uh, extend for six months and gave him, would give him some uh, time off. He also didn't like the assignment. He was going to go into B-52s and he didn't want that. But if you extended, then you'd, you'd get uh, six more months of combat and another assignment. So you're kind of back in the fishbowl and, and, and get, a, get an another one. Uh, so that was all the question, whatever happened to Ed. And so I was due for a, a couple of days off and there was an OV-10 squadron. So um, I got, got in the back seat of that and we went over the area where Ed was down and I had uh, what was called stabilized binoculars. They were uh, ones that uh, with all the vibration and everything stayed, stayed pretty good and looked for where he went down if there was some kind of a sign that, that he had, had made. I didn't see anything. As it turns out, he did cross the road. He was seen. There was an exchange of gunfire at that point, and even Kenny Field says, I know about where Ed was shot down and ejected. He knew the, he knew the, the direction, and he said, that night, I heard a gunfight, and it was a bang, 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 like a pistol, and then a which is an automatic weapon. So he said, I think he fought it out and lost. That was, that was his, his thought. As it turns out, Ed uh, exchanged gunfire but was not caught, but they still somehow followed him. He could, evidently, they would uh, hit sticks together, which gave them sound, and they could keep track of each other in some magical way. So he, um, he traveled, and when it became daylight, um, he climbed up in a tree. He said he was about 75 foot up in, up, in, up in the tree, and he said, of all things that could happen, the North Vietnamese practically formed a base camp at the base of the tree he was in. What are the odds of that? It wasn't exactly there, but it was very, uh, very close. So on the second day when we came out there, he didn't come up on the radio for fear he'd be heard. And we did bomb the, the, right in that area, but he said that was fine. He loved to see the, the you know, the flash and the and uh, tree limbs go flying in every direction. He said that was kind of a diversion. That was good. So he said on the morning of the third day, when we actually made the pickup, <clears throat> it looked like they were going to break camp. He said he could see people rolling up their backpacks and. One of the North Vietnamese even saw him down there, and he got out some tobacco and a paper and rolled a cigarette, put his backpack up against the tree Ed was there, sat on the backpack, lit the cigarette, looked, happened to look up, and saw him. And he said, here I'm 75 feet in the tree with a pistol. The North Vietnamese Army is down there. This guy ran and got his gun, shot up there, said it grazed his forehead, and he said, you know, I got caught, and so he dropped his pistol, came down, and was a prisoner of war for five five years. So fast forward for me, kind of finish this with long rescue, a long long effort. We did get our guy out, 189 missions. I flew uh, on all th all three days, and. Uh, I got out of the service when I came back and was a test pilot for Hughes Aircraft Company. And uh, within a couple of years, uh, I went to a conference, a flying safety conference, representing Hughes Aircraft Company at Kirtland Air Force Base. 
And uh, they had all contractor pilots uh, come in and hear these presentations. And lo and behold, one of the speakers was a Navy pilot by the name of Kenny Fields. I thought, what are the odds that this is in the fact the same guy? So he gave his presentation. I went up to him afterwards and I said, I think I know you, but I know you by a different name. And he looked at me like, I don't have any aliases or anything like that. I said, were you Streetcar 304, which was the call sign? And he said, yes. And he said, w were you there to me? And I said, yes, for three of the longest days of my, of my life. So we reconnected at that time point. We went out to have dinner together that night. And that's where I tried to ask him, do you have children? What are the names of your children? Uh, I didn't want to let the cat out of, out of the bag uh, that I knew that one of them should be named Sandy. Well, it turns out that uh, it was a boy uh, and they named him Todd. And um, the reason they named him Todd is that his wife, Shirley, uh, was not very happy to name a child Sandy because it reminded her of when he was shot down. And she went through a pretty emotional experience because her father was shot down in World War II and her mother had to raise three children on her own. So her first thought when she heard he was shot down is I'm gonna have to raise, I'm gonna be just like my mother and have to raise that. So <clears throat> Todd didn't come out very well, I'm physically. When, when he was, was born, the medics said, you know, there's something wrong with him, but they couldn't really diagnose it. Only thing they could come up with was the severe mental stress she went through for three days that he, her husband was lost, that that affected the embryo. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of wee, wow type of stuff. Uh, I have kept in touch with him for years and years, over, over, over 50 years, we've given uh, talks together multiple times. I've met, I've met Shirley, I've met uh, Todd. Um, he, um, I wrote my book, which has the streetcar 304, mm -hmm. and he decided to write a book about the rescue of streetcar 304, and uh, <clears throat> sent me his manuscript. I uh, thought it was a pretty good manuscript, uh, and I thought the best place for you is the Naval Institute Press, because you're, it's a Navy story. They picked it up, they published it, he gave talks all the way, he really followed the book. It became a, kind of a bestseller uh, f uh, for, the, for them. Um, one of the interesting things for me is that I remember one time I was flying with Hughes Aircraft Company, it was Christmas time, and I was having a bad day as we're all, for one reason or another, something insignificant in our real life has got you down. And the phone rang and it was Kenny and he said, thank you for saving my life. Made a big difference that particular day. Anyhow, so kind of to end somewhat the story to some degree, it's make it more current. Um, Kept in touch with him, and in 2000, early 2018, he. Oh, I guess uh, the other factor of of part of this is that uh, I think it was 1998. It turns out that uh, Ed Leonard, who was the POW, came back. Uh, he would take a physical every year at Pensacola, so that they're tracking. Even though he had retired from the Air Force. They would track uh, these POWs to see how captivity as a POW had affected the rest of their life. I mean, normally retirees don't get physicals that they, it's, you're just another person. And so we heard that it would be um, in the spring of 1998, Pensacola, and he was supposed to be there on a Monday morning. And the weekend before that, the Jolly Greens were having a reunion uh, at Fort Walton Beach. So the word got out is that uh, Ed's going to be there. Maybe we can have the debriefing of Streetcar 304 and maybe get the survivor there. I had been in touch with him. He lived in North Carolina. So I called Kenny. He said he would, would, be, would be there. 
I picked him up at the airport. He was very worried because now he was going to meet Ed Leonard, the guy who had spent five years in jail for him. So that's, uh, you kind of feel guilty. And he said to me, he said, you know, everybody's going to wonder what I did with my career. Did I get the Nobel Prize? Did, was, I worth, was I worth picking up for seven airplanes and 189 missions? You know, that's kind of a survivor's guilt. Well, he was well ex accepted. And they met for, uh, for the first time. And so what we did in a conference room in, that mo in a motel, not part of the Jolly Green program, eight of us got together, Ed Leonard, uh, Ken. Ed was on the ground for three days and gets captured. Kenny's on the th ground three days, gets rescued. I was the only one that had flown all three days, but there was the rest of the five people had flown one mission or two or, or, or something. We didn't have the helicopter pilot. And so we went through chronological over about three hours, who did what, whenever, to what were you doing when I was doing this. And uh, two helicopter pilots, active duty Air Force helicopter pilots that were there for the Jolly Green reu reunion sat in on this. And they were out of the weapons school at Nellis. And they listened to the story and they said, wow, you guys got to come to Nellis and give us a presentation. So six months later, we did go to Nellis and gave the presentation. Now we had the helicopter pilot that was there. Kenny, Kenny was there. And that's when we decided to form this organization, the Society of Combat Search and Rescue. And the, uh, so uh, we thought what we'll do is every year we'll go to a military base, Navy or Air Force, and debrief a hostile rescue that we were encountered to the active duty guys that are now have this mission as a learning experience for them, uh, which is a very complicated deal because if you're going to take a particular rescue, you got to find the survivor, you got to find maybe the helicopter pilot, you got to find the Sandy, and they're scattered all over the country. And now you guys are all going to get together and give a presentation without a dry run. Who's bringing maps? Who's got photographs? And these guys meet for the first time in 30 years, and now we're giving a talk in an hour. <laughs> so it was a challenge. We did that year after year after year, and, uh, and was, were quite, uh, quite successful. So kind of one of the, the most recent chapter that has to do with Kenny Fields um, was that uh, in contact with him in, uh, I believe, about January of 2018, his wife came down with pancreatic cancer and uh, talked with him a number of times. Pretty soon she was at home in hospice, not expected to live. And so I live in California. So I told my wife, you know, maybe I ought to be a, go out there and be with Kenny. We've known each other 50 years under unusual circumstances. And my wife, she said, no, here's what I, I think you should do. Wait till his wife dies, then go out. That's when he's going to need somebody around because the memorial service is over. Everybody leaves. Now he's in the empty house by himself. And, and that'll be a time when he needs somebody around. So that's what I did. And, uh, you know, Todd is still, uh, he, he looks kind of like an alien. He's somewhat autistic, somewhat developmentally delayed, somewhat poor IQ. I mean, he can dress him and he can eat, but He'll never marry, never have children, never have much of a job like that. So he, Kenny still takes care of him now, even after his wife, you know, he's that. So um, we've had a long, long time together. Uh, most recently he remarried and I kind of wanted to go, go to the wedding. It just seemed like something you ought to do. But with COVID and all the way across the country and my age, 86, uh, it just didn't work out. Otherwise, I, I, I would have gone. Just to, you've been there for him every step of the way. Over and over. I'm, I'm sure he was okay with you yeah. not being there, yeah. but he probably missed you. you know, and, and even uh, Ed Leonard passed away 
a number of, of years ago. And, um, you know, uh, that was, that also is a, a really, really unusual uh, story in that Ed had graduated from the Air Force Academy. When he was a student at the academy, they went on some field trip and he met this girl, girl in Arizona that was going to school and they became kind of uh, friends and dated a little bit and then lost track of, of each other. And um, Ed, Ed got married. Um, when I met him in Southeast Asia, he kind of was the one that was my IP that checked me out. He was going through a divorce. That was another reason why he, he extended. And so what had happened is he had heard that this girl made contact with her that had been in Arizona. Her name was Suzanne. She was now a teacher in the Philippines. And because he had extended, they gave him a couple of weeks off and he thought with space available, he could go over to the Philippines and see Suzanne. Well, guess what? He gets shot down and he gets captured. So he can't tell her he's not coming. He just doesn't show up. So what does she think? I guess he's not interested, right? She doesn't know he, he's shot down. None of us knew the, that part. So she goes on with her life and, and, gets, and gets married. So um, he spends five years gets uh, gets returned, and he told me, he said he married the first round-eyed gal that he saw when he got off, <laughs> off the plane. So that lasted about six months and went through a divorce with that. So fast forward, I think uh, he was, um, that's right. So he got back on active duty. He was flying RF-4s out of Austin uh, there and retired, got a degree from the University of Texas in law, uh, was a practicing lawyer for the state of, of Texas in Austin. Fast forward then this sometime in there, uh, I knew he was there and, and I went to a wedding and met up with him for the first time in uh, 30 some years, saw him uh, face to face. And he was going through divorce number three at, at that time period. So um, uh, we talked a little bit and then shortly after that, he got laid off uh, from uh, the state of, of Texas and somebody called him, one of our Sandy guys and said, you know, uh, this old love interest of yours, Suzanne, uh, has terminal cancer and you might wanna go, go see her. So he went to see her and it was the love of his life that bloomed up. So they got married. She had been married and divorced three times. He had been married, divorced three times. She survived cancer. He survived captivity. And this was a love story to the ages. I mean, these were, they were really, really something. A number of years after they got married, he, they lived up in, in, uh, on the coastline of Washington. He was actually the mayor of a little, little town up there. And after my book uh, got published, uh, my wife and I went up to visit, uh, visit, visit them. And I was kind of worried because in my book, I state that she had cancer. And some people don't like that to be alert, even if you've kind of beaten it. Sometimes you never really totally beat it. It goes down for a while and then comes back. And so um, I met him and went into his office and it had all of you know his photographs and all of the things of, of his career. And he told me the you know, whole story of five years in captivity. And sometime, I guess around midnight or something, Suzanne came in where we were sitting and had five copies of my books for me to autograph. And I thought, that's a good sign. That's, I, I feel okay. And God, we must have stayed up till three or four o'clock and I heard the whole story of, of, of captivity. And so that was, that was a good, good experience. He, he suffered a lot. Uh, he was strapped, you know, with your arms behind you. So he had, you know, replacement shoulders, replacement hips, replacement knees. 
he had gained a lot of weight because he said, I missed a lot of meals in five years. I ain't gonna miss, <laughs> miss another one. So he, he blossomed up in, in weight. Eventually he ended up uh, with a Segway. She became kind of the, uh, more of the explorer than he was kind of the, the homebody. He died five, six, seven, eight years ago and a memorial service for him in, in Ilwaco, uh, Washington. Kenny Fields wanted to come out and you know say something, but wasn't able to do it, so he sent me words, and I talked with Suzanne, and it was kind of a strange situation. It, the memorial service was in a church, but, but we were the first of what was to do be two memorial services. So they had a limited time they could be in the sanctuary. So uh, Suzanne asked if I would say a few words, but nobody else. Uh, so I did read what Kenny had um, written for me to write, and then I read some of my parts out of the book that talked, to, talked about him. And then afterwards in the reception, there were three guys who had been POWs with him that wanted to say something. And so I got kind of the headliner thing about him because I saw him, I was the last one to see him parachute, the only one to see him parachute in the trees, but the last one to see him before he got captured. And so um, that was a special occasion to be able to uh, be there for, uh, before his memorial. And I still fly. I have a World War II airplane. I fly as part of a museum, the Australia Warbird Museum, and we put together Freedom Flight, a flight of three airplanes that fly Memorial Day, Veterans Day, all kinds of, of events like that. I fly the right wing and do the missing man formation because I have a little more power than the other ones. And frequently I dedicate uh, our flights to Ed and what he did as a, a Sandy in that rescue. He, he, went, he went through a lot. It shortened his life, uh, but he was an amazing character, uh, an absolutely amazing character. It was, he, uh, he looked like um, Alfred E. Newman in Mad Magazine, you know, ears out a little bit and freckles, and, and the way he talked was what me worry. He even convinced Kenny Fields, that it all worked out best because Kenny would not have been able to survive the five years, and I could. And he said it was the best five years of my life when I was captured and a prisoner of war. And we all said, why was that? And he said he was in solitary confinement for quite a bit of time, and he said I had time to think about myself. I redid every Christmas, every birthday, every event of my whole life. And he said, I came to the conclusion that I wasn't a very good person. And that if I never get back, people will remember the old Ed Leonard. I'm going to be a different person. I got to get back to prove to everybody I'm a better person than I was. That's what kept him going. That's how he got and that's how he got back. So it was an amazing story of how I've connected with my lead who shot down and Kenny who was on the ground. We have really a lifetime experience. Uh, that's an amazing mindset. It is. Well, I imagine to survive you have to do something. You got to come up with something. <laughs> because anger's not going to work. That'll burn you up. All right. That is, that, is, that is a brilliant mindset. You know, Making the best of my time. You know, and the other thing he said, he said, you know, the, the guards finally got tired of beating him. He, he said, I could take it longer than they could. Uh, I mean, they're another human. I guess have some compassion. Normally you don't think when you're being beaten up by Asians, uh, that it takes much out of him, but he said they finally just got tired of beating him. <laughs> he, he, he was an amazing individual, and to, you know, I sensed that when he was briefing me. His, his briefings were long, and his debriefings were long. It went on hours and hours and hours, and I sat there and listened to it, and I remember thinking one time, 
good God, how long am I going to have to to listen to this guy? And then I thought to myself, you know, I'm here for a year. And whether I sit here and listen to Ed Leonard or sit on the John, it's going to be one year. So maybe, I ought to, maybe I'll learn something. And sure enough, what happened to me as I became a lead and got further and further into my year, my debriefings got longer and longer and every possible contingency of this could happen and that could happen. I think I did the same thing that, that Ed did. That was because you were trying, did you say it as he was, you're trying to pass on so much knowledge in such a short period. Because there's so many things that can happen. Yeah. Every, every, every rescue was different and uh, so, you know, that's been an amazing story. Part of it because of the writing of the books um, and also probably unusual because I got out of the military. So I didn't have the connections with with other people. Uh, but to a degree, I was still kind of in. I was still flying military airplanes, doing military tests, going to military ranges and everything, but I wasn't on active duty. I was a, I was a civilian. But, um, you know, I guess the irony for me is that when I was at Edwards as a fighter test pilot, it was absolutely the best job in the world. Best, best job in, in the world. The guys that, uh, the senior guys, majors and colonels, had shot down MiGs in, uh, in, in Korea. Uh, they were smart, they were good pilots, they had beautiful wives. I mean, they were just the cream of the crop. And I was awed to fly with them. They are flying the X-15. Uh, these, these were better than the, than the uh, Mercury astronauts. Uh, seriously, they, they were really b better than that. And uh, the idea was for me, stay there as long as you can, work your way up. They're not going to give a new guy uh, the big jobs. You got to work your way up uh, through, through that. And the longer you stayed, the better it would be. So I didn't want to volunteer to go to war with a three-year-old son and a six-year-old son. And so I waited it out and I got assigned to go fly this tailwheel prop airplane in Southeast Asia. The worst thing that I could get, I need to go over there and fly 105s or F4s and shoot down a couple MiGs, go back to Edwards with a big badge, you know. Now I got credentials, move me up, deep select me, let me get to fly the X, X-15. I'm going in a tailwheel prop and um, I thought, what is this? Well then I find out, you know, we're involved with rescue and the mission and and you get caught up in that. Uh, I mean, that was probably, if I'd flown F-4s or 105s, there was hardly any uh, MiGs out there. I wouldn't have been ace or get any, any shots like that. But I was involved with a mission that was outstanding with guys that were really, really good. And that was something else that kind of came to in writing the book, is how good these A-1 pilots were in delivering bombs and doing the, the rescue role. And I thought back, you know, I flew with guys that became admirals and generals and astronauts, and one guy went to the moon. I don't think those guys were as good a pilots as these guys. And some of these were instructors, some were flight and safety officers, some were maintenance officers. None of them appeared to be on a fast track to make general. Why were they so good? Uh, the only thing I can come up with is that they rose to the occasion. It was a team, and nobody wanted to let the team team down. We're not going to lose because of me. I'm going to I'm going to do what I can do, and so you get caught up with this team, kind of a team spirit. If you've ever been on a, a team or a play or something where everybody is supporting each other, uh, it's a, that's a big thing. And it's easy really to get carried away with that. It, it, it is, it's something pretty big. So we really, and reality is the opposites that we have in life. It was the best assignment that I could, could have ever gotten. Um, and so it led to writing a book. It led into the CSAR. I was in charge of all of the programs and getting people together. And 50 years later, we're still getting together and going over our stories, and now we meet the survivors, like uh, um, 
John Piricello. Um, I mean, that is amazing that I was able to connect with him and get him to come to one of these events and that he would go over to Laos and find his dad's wreckage on the ground. What are the odds that all of that would come together? Um, that story alone, I was in Fort Walton Beach two years ago when those three guys sat down. It was Brian, Danielson, John Piricello, and there was another gentleman. Right. All of their fathers were MIA. Right. And they'd heard that the wing off Brian's father's plane was in this orphanage or a church <laughs> or it was in it. So Brian said, I'm going back. Mm -hmm. and we, you know, they'd, they'd been looking for his father. And when they got there, it wasn't Brian's wing. He had brought those two guys with him. And it turned out to be the third fellow's father's wing. And then they decided to go up the river to another wreck site. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think John was staying back by the boat. He was like, I'm tired, you guys go ahead. Mm -hmm. And Brian and the, the other gentleman had walked up through the jungle. And John you know, called them and he said, get back here, get back here. And they had walked right over the radial engine and right. the cowling right. <laughs> of John's father's right. plane. I know. And when I talked to Brian, at first he was disappointed because, you know, he hadn't achieved his mission right. to find the wing right. of his father's plane. But what he did was he took two other guys that their, their fathers were missing in action or killed in action, and they were able to actually touch the parts of theirs. So you don't always get out of life what you think you want. What you want. But, you know, I really believe that there is something that leads us, right. just like you with your A1 story, it was the, it's what Best. you needed. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it was not what I wanted, but what I got, and, and I made the best of it, mm -hmm. too. And sometimes you have to make the best, best of it uh, for whatever it was. I, you know, I wasn't happy uh, there. Uh, it wasn't what I wanted to do. I mean, there was the mission, you tried to perform it. Um, my assignment out of there was to be an instructor in the A1 at Hurlburt. And that's the last thing I wanted to do. Uh, my wife, we wrote letters back and forth, took five days to get it. She said, you know, she'd never been overseas. Maybe I could get an assignment in Europe, fly some kind of fighters in Europe. And I said, well, if I go over there, I'm going to be sitting on alert. And I did alert before I went through the test pilot school. I'm tired of being on alert and flying a couple days, then on alert, a couple days off, and on alert. It's a, it just got old. So I said, I, I don't want to. I don't want to do that. Uh, I like the testing, so I'm going to get out of the Air Force. And so I resigned to be effective when I came back. I didn't have a job. Now I had a seven-year-old son and a four-year-old son, and I'm unemployed coming back to uh, California. But I set up some interview trips and got a job with Hughes Aircraft Company and flew with them for, uh, for 20 years. And, uh, and that, was, that was good. I, I was more of an aviator than an officer. I loved the airplanes, uh, but the only place these airplanes are is in the military. <laughs> I mean... They don't, you don't buy an F-4 and go fly it unless you're extremely wealthy. It takes countries to own airplanes like that. But Hughes had military airplanes that they were putting weapon systems on and doing testing. And I was good at that. I was really, really, really good at that uh, in working with the engineers and, and, and uh, fly-off competitions. I was involved uh, with the uh, F-14 program, the F-15, the F-16, the F-18, the stealth bomber. Maverick Missile, a whole host of extremely successful smart weapons that were made for the Cold War, but in fact used during the Gulf War. And so uh, I, after the combat book, I decided to write a book about um, my 20 years with Hughes Aircraft Company to include Howard Hughes stories. Because the senior pilots, the old guys when I went to work with Hughes that were 45 years old, had been World War II pilots, they were hired by Howard. They flew with Howard. The mechanics who worked on my airplanes worked on Howard's airplane. There was all kinds of Howard Hughes stories floating around. 
Uh, he was unfortunately drugged up in Vegas at, at the time, but everybody said, you know, he's a private airport, he has his own airplanes, he could fly in here at any time, so always be ready. He could, he could be right there. Even his racer, the air, airplane, he set the world speed record in 1935, it was in a Quonset hut right next to ours. And when visiting Air Force Navy pilots would come, I'd take them over there, it had a big tarp on top of it, I knew the caretaker of all of the Hughes airplanes, and so he would let us in. You had to get a flashlight because there was a big tarp on this and get underneath it and kind of work your way up because pilots always want to look in the cockpit. I always thought, you know, might find Howard sitting in there, <laughs> asleep or, or dead or dead. Anyhow, um, so I uh, decided to uh, write a book about my 20 years um, with Hughes Aircraft Company and had a pretty big manuscript uh, about Howard and about my 20 years with that. Meanwhile, my acquisition editor for the combat book, Cheating Death, Mark Gatlin, he moved from Smithsonian over to being the director of the Naval Institute Press. So he contacted me and said, how are you doing on, on, the, on the Hughes book? And I said, well, I got a pretty big manuscript, but an interesting thing. In my research of getting Howard Hughes materials, I run into a screenwriter in LA who is writing a screenplay about Howard Hughes and wants to get a movie made. And we had shared some, some information. He used some of mine for his screenplay. I used some of his stuff. Uh, it turns out that he became one of the four producers of the movie, The Aviator. Asked me if I wanted to be a technical consultant, and I said yes. So the movie is going to come out in December of 2005. I've got a manuscript uh, that is 150,000 words uh, in about like February, March of 2005. So Mark Gatlin says, okay, here's, here's what we'd like to do. Split that book in two. Make one a biography of Howard Hughes, and we want that out two months before, before the movie. So we can take advantage of the movie coming out. Then the other will be your third book now, which is about your, your 20 years. But he said, I can only give you two months to break it up with all the production things Holy that you cow. have to do. So I broke it up, and I said I can do it, and sent him the manuscript. My book came out in October of 2004. Got contacted by the Air and Space Museum in downtown Washington. They wanted me to give a talk from my book uh, in their IMAX theater. Have you ever been to the Air and Space Museum? I'm yeah. IMAX theater about Howard Hughes on a Wednesday evening, free to the free to the public. Giving a talk in an IMAX theater is really a toughie because all of the seats go up like this and you have this humongous uh, screen behind you. And like so, six stories, seven stories. Oh, it is huge. And when you're standing here at the podium and looking back and forth and everything, I got a little woozy. <laughs> Anyhow, so the positive part about this is that I did, I did, give, uh, I did give the talk. The following day was a Thursday, November 11th, Veterans Day. I got to go over to the wall. I'd been there before, but never on Veterans Day. And to be there when guys are in uniform and a speech and all that, I mean, that was, that was super, uh, super duper. So um, technical consultant um, on that, I read it, didn't think it was very good. Turns out the movie was made. Uh, my guy invites me to the premiere. We go to the premiere, we have 50 yard, it was in a theater, 50 yard line seats right there. Uh, afterwards, talk with DiCaprio. He asked me, how did I do? Well, you made $20 million, that's, that's not too bad. But the interesting thing on that is he went into details of, of how I did. And there was a group of people I felt very uncomfortable because I wasn't, you know, in this situation, the fact that the screenplay wasn't accurate wasn't his fault. 
he memorizes his lines, he stands where he is, he says his line, and you know, you start over with another one. So it wasn't his fault that that was, that was phony. So I got a cut out guard. I did give him a, a positive review. What I thought about afterwards in thinking about that, that situation was that, uh, like, uh, like John, He's an actor, so he does his thing, and then the director calls him over and says, you know, going to do shoot number 22, 3, 4, 5. This time, turn your head here and put more emphasis on that word or whatever it is. You got to listen, and then you got to do it. We're not used to doing that. We kind of talk on a high level. It doesn't make any difference how you talk, I talk, or whatever. It's just kind of, you know. It's different for probably an actor like that. Okay. And that's kind of the way he treated me as a director. <laughs> I'm not a director, but I was Johnny on, on the spot. Uh, I mean, this is a highfalutin guy. He won five Academy Awards. Interesting thing, um, you know, when I was getting my book published, uh, I talked with uh, the screenwriter and I said, uh, you know, my publisher says, is there any way that DiCaprio or Scorsese could write a cover quote or do something like that. He said, let me, let me check. He said, no, they'll just think that uh, you're leeching on, on their movie, which is exactly what I, what I was doing. <laughs> and and, I, uh, he, and he, they also said, you know, he told me, he said, both of them have a fear of flying. He said, why are they making the aviator then if if they don't even care for aviation, they don't want to be a, in an airplane. And he's, and so we talked over and he said, you know, they're going for the Academy Award. This is, um, they, they remembered uh, the movie, what was the one on autism? Uh, um, you know the one I mean. Yes, I do. Okay. Yes. Um, few people had heard much about autism at that time until uh, Dustin Hoffman played uh, played the part of that. So they feel that Howard had obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD. And so that's what they play in this. They made it an epic, the uniforms, the outfits that they wore, the music and everything was, was big time. So they were going for the Academy Award. Uh, they did very good in Golden Globe, but we got beat out by Clint Eastman and his Million Dollar Baby. Uh, that won the uh, won the Academy Award. Both of them have gone on to you know DiCaprio's gotten the best uh, uh, actor and Scorsese also. Uh, so you know they're high highfalutin uh, people. So they they went went on, uh, but it was it was fun to be a part of that uh, of that ac activity. Uh, it all became because of 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 writing, writing the book. Um, so I've had a good run in aviation and art. Uh, I've written five books now, five nonfiction aviation books. Um, you don't make a lot of money on that, but that wasn't my intention ever. Um, it's, it's preserving the history, telling the yeah, story. That, that's been, been a good, good time. When we first stepped in here, you had something you had said something, and I'd like to go back to that. And it was something to the effect that you realized you were a small cog in a big wheel. Mm -hmm. Could we go back into that a little bit about that moment of realization of where you fit in the military or fit in the order? Mm -hmm. um, and if, if you don't want to, that's fine. No, um, well, you know, um, went over there in April of, of uh, 1968. And you know, learn learn to fly the airplane, learn to drop the bombs, learn to do rescues. Uh, thought I got got pretty good. Uh, led rescues, um, successful ones and unsuccessful ones. Had to leave at times when um, you lost con contact. And, and even one just a, as as kind of a sideline, one of the uh, an F four went down. They had con radio contact with both both survivors. They got out of the plane, they were on the ground, they had the radios out and they're talking. We get scrambled. By the time I get out there, it's only the backseater that 
uh, comes up on the radio. Front seater didn't. We went in and picked up the back seater, brought him home um, successful. Uh, it was just one more, one more uh, mission. Fast forward here a couple years ago on Facebook, um, a young lady who was a retired detective or police officer or something had made contact with the, uh, the guy that we didn't get, his wife, who also connected me on Facebook. And then she made contact with uh, the son of the backseater and thought that I should be in touch with him. And so I did talk with him uh, on the phone and found out that you know he's now the son of the guy that, uh, that I picked up. And it turns out he was born after uh, his dad was in combat. And he said, you know, if you hadn't picked up my father, I wouldn't be alive. Think that over. Yeah. I mean, uh, so these things, you know, kind of come up later on. But at the time, it doesn't seem like the war's going anyplace. As a matter of fact, my last combat mission wasn't far from where the first one was. And we lost 12 guys. Two guys were burned. One guy shot down, turns out he's captured. One guy gets the Medal of Honor. Uh, there's a lot a lot going on, and the war, where's the war going? It doesn't seem to be going any place. And we're losing airplane after not only us, uh, but everybody. Everybody we rescue is somebody ejected out of a plane. So there's a, a, a whole host of airplanes uh, and military equipment that are being lost. Where's this thing going? You know, everybody kind of thought, well, it'd be like Korea. We'll have a truce, and the North will take the North, the South will take the North. Well, that didn't happen as it came into 1975. They did the big evacuation, and everybody saw on television the airplanes take off, and they land on a carrier, push them over the side and everything, and people hanging on the wheel wells of a C-135 when it takes off from Da Nang, uh, trying to get out of there just like we've recently seen in Afghanistan. And so that was the low point right then. What was this all about? I lost 12 friends, and now we just walked away. Uh, so uh, that's where, you know, when it did nothing change. I, I didn't change. We didn't win the war. I didn't lose the war. Uh, what was this all about? It turns out that it, in my giving talks, I've kind of said, well, it's part of the Cold War. And we won the Cold War. But we, you know, and... The, if you try and look at the positive things of that, is that we only rescued in the daytime. We had no electronic equipment of anything. It was a fist fight. Uh, we shoot them, they shoot, shoot us back and forth. As a result, I think, of Vietnam, we went into the smart weapons, which is I tested at Hughes. Now these things are, are accurate. They're going to work. You're not going to waste bombs. Uh, it's going to be good. We have GPS. So we know where things are. Uh, they have night vision goggles, so they like to rescue at night. That gives them an advantage that the people on the ground don't have with handheld things. So we learned, uh, I think, weapons lesson. The other thing I thought we learned is that these protracted, limited wars are not to our advantage. Uh, sh the shorter, the better. And I thought we learned that in Gulf War One. Gulf War II and Afghanistan, we, I guess we didn't learn that, and we've had a recent disaster where we've left again all kinds of equipment behind. We're in a position where we've failed our, our allies. I think you have to kind of question, if you're a young person, do you really want to go into a military that uh, operates like it, like it does? I was of a different generation. I kind of grew up during World War II. When I went in the military, uh, all of the senior pilots were World War II guys. They were big winners. They won two wars in four years, halfway around the, wor the world. These guys were big winners. And are we big winners anymore? What, where are we and what are we doing? So 
Do we learn lessons? I don't know. Um, I think we learned some. But when you get back to this slippery slope where we just mm -hmm. came back through the same thing, mm -hmm. we did not apply the knowledge we learned. We it's interesting. Did not. You know, it, and it's kind of, you know, the, um, the big advantage we have as a country is the value of each human being. We see that in Black Lives Matter, we see that in our military, where we go out to get things, but it's also a disadvantage, certainly in war, uh, because the enemy doesn't hold that same theory. And so that's a real advantage uh, in war. Um, but that's the reason for smart weapons, and that's the reason for drones, is to kind of keep your people from hand-to-hand uh, -hand fighting on the ground, because we're not gonna, gonna win that, uh, that battle. So back to your, your thought of, of being a small cog in this big wheel. Um, you know, I got assigned a flight and I flew the flight. The next day they assigned the flight, they put the weapons on board, they tell you where to go and I, I do that. So this big wheel is, is, is turning over. I can't get off of the wheel until I finish 12 months. I can't change the weapons load. I can't change the engines that typically uh, failed, the guns that exploded. Uh, you take what, uh, what you got. <laughs> kind of the Forrest Gump, uh, what's the one about the chocolates? Uh, That's uh, lots of chocolates. <laughs> you don't know what, what chocolate you're, you're picking up. And uh, you, know, you can even make the case that 12 of you guys are going out to fly 12 airplanes and one of the airplane's engine's going to fail on takeoff. And we're optimistic. Pilots got to be optimistic. I won't get that airplane. This guy will get that, air, that airplane. <laughs> you got to be optimistic. And the same was true for shooting. Uh, they'll shoot at somebody else. They won't shoot at me. Uh, it's called the big sky theory that uh, there's a bunch of airplanes up there and people shooting and they'll shoot at somebody else. They won't shoot at me. I mean, there's no logic to that, but it's a uh, pilot. I guess you have to be optimistic uh, and you have to rely on people. I guess that's the other big thing there. Uh, you have to rely on the maintenance guys that are maintaining that, uh, the radar operators, the armors that uh, put that on. All of these people are the support for you and they can make you or they can break you um, on, on that. So uh, I think that's something that you also kind of learn in aviation is how to trust people and be trusted, mm -hmm. um, which is maybe a little different in the civilian world. I think there's a little more competition uh, there oh, and, yeah. and uh, adversity and trying to get the goods on somebody or making somebody look bad like that. And in the military, it's the team mentality. Ab absolutely. Exactly. But not all, te all teams. Here's yes. again uh, something that my wife had picked up. Uh, I went through the test pilot school 1964. We have only had one reunion, and that was at the 50, at the 50 year, the year point. Only one reunion. One reunion. I'm going to kind of get shot with you. And you've only had one reunion. One reunion as a test pilot. How many reunions have I had uh, with, with the Sandys? Many, many, many. And my wife came up with an interesting thing. She said, uh, you know, um, you guys supported each other in combat and you owe your life to the other guys as they owe their life uh, to you. She said, that was totally different when you went through the test pilot. When you went through the test pilot school, you tried to be the best pilot. You had to be the best one at academics. You had to be the best looking wife. You had to have the smartest children. You guys were all competing and you still are. And so if you have a reunion and don't have a good career, <laughs> a good looking wife and smart children, you probably aren't gonna show up. Why show up if you're in second place or third place? So she said, no wonder you guys don't get together. You're still competing with each other. And unless you feel like you're on top, you ain't gonna go. <laughs> Your <laughs> and, life is brilliant. Uh, so she comes up with these things, which is, you know, has 
a lot of a lot of truth may not be completely true, but it, it, it there's enough truth in it that that. And she said that's totally different when I see you guys get together in combat. You have a bonding that has lasted through years and years and years. And even though you may not have seen somebody in 30 years and have wear glasses and have gray hair, it's just like you were together yesterday. And that is true. You've seen that played over and over again. And probably even becomes more sensitive as we get older because we all realize this may be my last time. And we've already you know, lost some. The older ones are, are gone. So. Uh, there's always lessons to be learned as an individual, let alone a country, and we don't always take lessons. We don't always always learn lessons. We have to learn things over and over again. But been a good show. I'm glad I came again and saw who I I uh, I did see, and kind of realized I need to make some phone calls when I get home and talk with Gene and Al that weren't here. Um, while I can, yep. and talk with Kenny while I can. I can't talk with Ed anymore. I can still dedicate flights to him. Um, do what I can do while you can do it, you know, till the end. Never know when that is. At, at least be flying when, when it comes to an end. <laughs> I mean, still pressing on. Um, That's a good way to look at it. You know. Um, a very good way. Yeah. So I'm I'm pleased that I wrote the book. I think that I think that helped a lot for many many reasons. You know, it reconnected people. It uh, uh, got other people. You know, Don Dunaway wrote his his book. Uh, Kenny Fields wrote wrote his book. Um, so uh, and a and a variety. So I mean, there's been surprises over and over again. One of the things I wrote in the book on. Uh, my uh, first rescue in North Vietnam, F-4 guys that were, uh, were shot down. We picked both of them up and, and went on. And they went some other place. And in the book, I write that um, who they were and that we didn't have a party where they could buy a beer for everybody that was part of the rescue. Fast forward, the F-4 pilot stays in the military, retires, was up in the Bay Area visiting his sister or something, or his, no, his, da his daughter and, and uh, wife went out shopping or something, and he's standing in front of a bookstore, and he sees this book here, Cheating Death. He walks around, picks up the book, opens it up, here's the story of, of, uh, of actually, he was the lead and lost his, um, his wingman. And then we rescued him. So here's this, this whole story. And so he knows where these guys that we picked up are. And so we have this reunion in Las Vegas and these two guys come. And they read in here where they owe us this. So they got in Vegas the biggest bottle of champagne that you can, that you can buy, a huge one like that, and little little cups. And we everybody that was in the whole Caesar thing that we had got a, a little cup of, of, of champagne. So um, I mean that. And then this guy wrote a book. Um, so it encouraged other people to write. It hooked us people together. Uh, we had a lot of really, really good times out of what's kind of a bad situation, you know? I mean, death and the war and... I mean, that was... I, I don't know that that was a good show. Uh, it certainly wasn't for John and people that lost, lost ones, but... I guess we're making up the best we can uh, yes. to be able to write and get together uh, has been glue for all of us and been important uh, to do. And so you've seen that, I'm sure, and this is the second time you've come yes. to, to yes. one. So you've seen it play out. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I've seen highs and lows. Oh, absolutely. There'll be a moment somebody will be talking 
and they're right here, rock solid. And they'll have that oh, yeah. memory, that moment, and you can just see them, mm, and you know they'll they'll compose themselves, or you know, and they'll talk about the friend that they were right next to, and then they were gone. Yeah. And uh, there were two gentlemen that sat in that chair two years ago, and they had rescued a guy, and uh, one of the uh, guys looked at the other, and he said, "About two weeks after the rescue, did you get a?" A letter in the mail on blue stationery and you could see the other fellow just pick up and he goes I did and it was from the mother of the man who they had rescued somehow she had found out everybody in that whole SAR <laughs> and she wrote them a note on blue stationery thanking them for saving right. her son's life and um, the one pilot looked at the other one and he goes how long did you keep it and the other guy's so choked up he can't talk at all he goes <laughs> still have it today. Oh, sure. And they, they both agreed that that was one of the most gratifying things that ever happened in the whole experience. So no matter what is out there, you know, we, I, I hope you know, that there are so many people that are grateful. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, just talking to you with your story, how many people you affected in your life mm -hmm. and inspired. And uh, anyway, I, I, I think that's... Yeah. But you're right, there's a lot of sad moments, uh, too, and the discovery of, of like, um, Kenny Fields and the child that was affected. Uh, yeah. He was a bystander, and still he's been affected by, by the war. Yeah. So it does have a lot of legs. And I guess, you know, you try and make the best of you can. They yeah. can. No, nothing's perfect. We all... Doesn't take long. You found that out when you were in college. That yep. life made a big, big 180 degree turn uh, in one mo one moment. And uh, there's a lot of wishes I did, could have done, should have done, whatever. And and those linger for a long, long, long time. Sometimes never get resolved, yep. and sometimes get resolved in ways you never would have guessed. You know. So look uh, for the good. Uh, like your mother. You give it, give it a shot, you know. Uh, uh, you know, and that was, the writing was interesting for me because uh, when the first book came out, The Cheating Death, um, it was supposed to come out at a certain time and then we were going to fly up to Idaho and, uh, and, uh, and see my mother. My sister also was there. She had married an Air Force doctor, and he had retired, was medical director of State Hospital in Idaho. So we were going to go out there. Well, it started getting delayed. Now the book's going to be delayed and delayed and delayed. Finally, it's going to be FedEx for a delivery on Sunday to my mother's uh, retirement home. And so um, I went down and picked up the package, came back, opened it up. There's one book. It's the first book. First time I've seen something published by me. And, and I had great doubts because uh, the Smithsonian Institute Press is located in the East Coast. I never met anybody that worked on it. It was strictly phone calls, emails, FedEx, back and forth. And I figured this, the photos will be upside down, they'll forget chapter seven, it'll, you know, it'll, it'll be screwed up. It was, it was really, really in good, in, in good, good shape. So I told my mom, I said, Mom, you, you can keep a uh, first copy of, of, my first, of my first book. And she was worried about being able to keep it. Matter of fact, the night before we left, she put it under her pillow to make sure that nobody else, <laughs> nobody, nobody else, else had it. Yeah. So uh, it became kind of a um, tradition that Mom got the first book of everyone that I published. So. Uh, the second book came out, the Howard Hughes one. I gave her one. The next time I saw her, she said, well, she wants two copies because she had loaned uh, the first, this first copy of this one out to other senior citizens, and they didn't always give it back. So she wanted the one that was signed, signed by her son. Um, so fast forward on the fourth book, which was the uh, test pilot book, um, went up to see 
my mom and I had it in what's called the galley proof, which is now still on typewriter paper, but it's the size of the book and it's the font and page numbers and everything. And that's my final review to go through for typos because yeah. you can't do anything that moves a line down for fear that now the pages and the index is going to be wrong. So anyhow, my mom had had a stroke uh, before she even got up, had a stroke 13 years ago. And so she had this arm was like this and the leg didn't work good, but she sat at the kitchen table and she went there. And I even I put a story about her in, in there, a flying story, because she's back in uh, Iowa in the 20s, sometimes she and her brother went up in an open cockpit airplane and his hat blew off while they were flying. And my mother remembered that it landed in the cornfield and they went down and they found it in the cornfield. That was the part that my, so that was the aviation story. So mom thought that was, that was kind of funny and it was gonna come out within a month or something and we came back to California and about a week later she passed away. So I thought now, She's not going to get a copy of that. So uh, she was in Idaho. Our family cemetery is in Illinois. It was November. And so my sister said, why don't we do this? She's going to be cremated, so we don't have to have a rush thing. Let's have it next May when everybody can be there. And uh, have, weather will be better and everything. So. Um, she was in charge of the cremation. She said for me to work with the little container that you put in the ground and work with the cemetery. I knew those people from my dad's thing. Anyhow, so uh, my sister had a, uh, a daughter who said, I wonder if grandma always liked chocolates. Would I be able to put a chocolate in with the ashes in this container? And my sister said, no, the reason you can't. And I thought, you know what I ought to do? is put the first copy of my fourth book in that little vault. So mom now has the first copy of the fourth book, which is what I did. <laughs> so if somebody ever opens that up, they're gonna wonder, the hell's that book doing in there? Yeah. So, so I, I guess, again, the point is, is that the wandering of life of left and right and up and down and doing the best out of whatever circumstance you find, um, and as you kind of heard from the general last night, um, he kind of referred that it wasn't really the Sky Raider, it was the Sky Raider pilots. And I mean, it gets the kind of glory because it's the plane, but in reality, it was the guys that were flying it and how they handled the situation, and that's what life is. It isn't what you wanted, it isn't what you bargained for, and, you know, if you stop and think one of the interesting things, we don't have a choice of our parents. We don't have a choice of what era we're born in. We don't have a choice of our location where we are. We just suddenly pop out of this egg like a chicken and say, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> which, which, where should I go? You know, which way's the wind blowing? Which is what some people do is they go with the wind, they go, and some people go upwind. I mean, it's, it's uh, give it a shot. You got, you got a time at bat, see what you can do with uh, 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, whatever it is. Same is true with heredity and, and diseases that uh, are heredity. You don't get a choice on that. You, here's, here's, what, here's what you got. Yeah. See what you can do with it. <laughs> that is very true. You know, so it's an interesting aspect of life. I guess we've been blessed as Americans. Democracy. Uh, importance of a single man, education, the best medical type of treatments that you can, that you can get. Um, you know, we've, we have an opportunity, mm -hmm. a big opportunity. How much we, it's how much you squander it with drugs and other things have taken a big hit on us. Yeah. That's a lot to think about. Yeah. Uh, Pretty for, good leaving it there. Would you like to go somewhere else and chat more? I think that's a great way to end it. With uh, what think part? Think about what you're going to do with your life. Mm -hmm. And accept what you can't change. You know, I'm keeping my life full. Um, I'm going to continue flying as long as I can. I'm continuing to support my children and grandchildren 
as best I can. Uh, I'm still active with our, our church. I built a church 25 years ago, and we just got a new pastor, and we're interested in buying a lot next to us. We have the money for it. I reconnected with the architect we had 30 years ago. I've got him together with our new minister. We're coming up with a new design. On my bucket list is to buy that last piece of land and have something kind of designed. I may not make it there, but my fingerprints will be on it. So um, same is true with our museum. Uh, we started one again 30 years ago. We're now up to 500 people. We have maybe 20 hulks of airplanes. We have a, a world-class auto auto display. I'm involved more with with the flying flying portion. Um, but it, next to our museum, we have a library, and the library is just not used very much. And certainly, young people they Google every everything, and so the thought has come up is to replace the library with my aviation items. And I have literally more things than the Smithsonian. I don't have airplanes, but I have, I knew everybody that was anybody in the American military during the Cold War from uh, that time period. And uh, this, uh, I have autographs that nobody else, absolutely nobody else else has. And so they've come up with the idea of shutting down the library. 2,500 books, a whole bunch of bookcases, what do you do with, with that? Uh, and replacing it with my, with my items. And um, I've already done kind of some sorts. You know, I probably have, I don't know, 10, 20,000 items. I mean, it's a huge, huge collection of aviation a military space and all that, because I knew, I knew the guy that took Earthrise, a good, a good, a good friend uh, of mine. Um, I know one of my classmates was Fred Hayes. He was on Apollo 13, yeah. explosion, uh, going to the moon, and lucky to get back. He lives in Houston. Is he's writing a book right now, and the title of that is "Don't Panic Early." <laughs> And if you've seen the movie, you know that yeah. uh, he's the one that got sick. Yeah. If you remember the guy, oh, one yeah. guy got sick and they had to power down. And it's 40 degrees in there, and he's got a T-shirt on. You know, they weren't dressed with with that. Anyhow, so um, uh, I know all these guys, and I've even asked them for more things now. Of, you know, uh, more three-dimensional things like uh, factory models that are autographed by. Bruce Hines, first flight of the B B2, Bob Gilliland, first flight of the SR-71, uh, the Raptor, all of, of uh, these planes and people I know. So that could be a major display for our museum. It would take a lot of work on my part because our we have a curator, a female, PhD. She's a smart gal but doesn't know much about aviation, so I'd pretty much have to help her with storyboards and all, yeah. and all of that. And so, I mean, um, that could be 20 years worth of stuff. So I don't have 20 years, but I got a little bit to give. So uh, I'm gonna, we're going to give it a shot uh, for the museum. So, uh, so I got, uh, got plenty left to, uh, to do. Well, I will get you a copy of all of this. <laughs> So if you want to use any of this, yeah. it's already done. All right. you got to do is cut what you need. Is that and one big thing, I'm, is today is what, Sunday? Yeah. Tomorrow, guess what I'm, I'm doing? It's, um, again, an amazing thing. I fly back, back to California, and a friend of mine who's out in the Edwards area, civilian, retired engineer, has a tire off of the, B, the B-70, the XB-70. You ever remember the big white, white airplane? They yeah, only yeah. built two of them. And uh, the number two crashed. I was there when it crashed. I chased it many, many times. The number one in 1968 flew to Dayton, Dayton, Ohio, mm -hmm. sat outside for a number of years. Finally, they put it inside a building, I guess, yes. and put new tires on it. This guy has a B-70 tire and wants to donate it to our museum. Wow. This thing is about 200 pounds. 17 and a half inches wide, and I'm going to try and put it in, in my car. Anyhow, fast forward, one of my classmates flew, a guy by the name of Don Malik, 
was one of the last pilots to fly uh, the B-70. He lives in Lancaster. I've been in touch with him. Tomorrow is his 91st birthday. Wow. So the well, three of us are going to get together, and I'm going to have him autograph that tire. I've got one of these Sharpie uh, yep. paint things yep. so that he can uh, write on, on the tire. This is a used tire. It was on the plane when it landed. Um, and so, I mean, what a, what a great thing to have for a museum. It's a one-of-a-kind thing. I'm afraid that the Air Force Museum at Edwards is going to hear about it, and, want it and, want, and they're going to want it. Uh, but they have a lot because I can put things together. I know him and somebody knows me with the tire. I can put something together that is unusual. Um, and, and I can still do it. <laughs> so you never know what can come around. So my wife obviously complains that I got too many things going on. She said, you're literally running from one place to another to another. When are you going to sit back and, and I guess I'm not That's the spirit. Until, until the end. So, um, well, thanks for taking the time to, no, to hear the you. story. Thank you uh, for taking the time well, to sit down and share this, and, and I really appreciate it. I mean, you know, there's hundreds of hours of this through all of the legs that everything, everything has expanded. Yes. Uh, you know, even just in the Sandy uh, thing, Community. I, I uh, through all that, you know. Coming up, yes. Uh, so, it, it, interesting story. One of the last things I'll say is, you know, I did encourage John uh, to write. Uh, I mean, he's an actor, but so he has some artistic talents. I don't know whether he has writing talents, but, you know, if the story's good enough, you don't have to have a lot of talent. Just tell the story and got people around that could maybe edit, and, and that's an unusual story of how, how he, how we met, and, and the one in a million chance that the guy that uh, is his director would read my book and contact me, yeah. that I knew him, and, and John, and John came there, and now here, uh, and then went to Laos. That's a hell of a story. It really is. And, um, it's an underdog story. And that's what I was trying to tell Brian, I said, you know, you, you, you've lived this horrible experience mm -hmm. and you're moving forward to do something. And, and what you made out of it yes. is... And you run into another roadblock, but you're not stopped. <laughs> it's the underdog. You keep on going. Yeah, that's it. Just keep moving forward. And, and that's, uh, that's worthy of writing and reading about. It has more of a universal appeal. You know, just even the Sandy thing. There's really few people that are that into aviation or Vietnam or anything like that. I mean, that's, that's a small market. Um, that's why it's hard to get an agent if you're a nonfiction writer, because you may be a one book person. If you're a novelist and you're reasonably good, you can put 20, 30 of those out and the price goes up and the agent makes more money. Uh, nonfiction military, you're not going to get an agent because there's just not a big market uh, for it. So, um, but his is a human appeal. Yes, uh, he does. And so that that will be in uh, Barnes and Noble in a different section. It won't be over there in military trains and boats, <laughs> which is a section about like that, that big, yes. you know, and uh, the human, you know. Gays in the military, that's the huge section. There's 80 books there or something like that. I mean, you know how that, that goes. Take one. Fast movers in the night means search and rescue at first light. Hey, beeper, come up, boys. Get your young ass on that horse. We took big errors on this song. Thank you.